All right. All right. We are going to talk today about histamines and we're going to talk about histamine intolerance. This is a question that has come up in my Hello Betty membership. And I thought we would do a geeky magic dive on the podcast today. So you've probably heard of antihistamines, right? That's the Benadryl. That's the medicines that tame, that tend to tame allergy symptoms. But do we really know what histamines are? <laughs> and uh, what I want to do today is I want to go over what histamines are, what a histamine uh, reaction might look like. And if you think you are histamine intolerant, what that might look like and what you can do. So histamine Histamines are basically chemicals that your immune system um, makes. They kind of act like bouncers at a club, right? So they help your body get rid of something that's bothering you. So um, in this case, it might be some sort of allergy trigger, right? Or an allergen. And what histamines do essentially is that they start the process of eliminating and hustling these allergens out of your body or off of your skin. So they will, histamines will cause you to sneeze, to tear up, to itch, uh, whatever it really takes to, uh, to get the job done. Um, they're part of your body's defense system. And um, of course, you know, your body's not working against you to make you itch because, you know, getting hives or something like that is, is not necessarily pleasant, but the intention of course, of your body of these histamines is to keep you safe, right? It's just the overreaction, um, that can give you those, you know, those allergy symptoms, or we're going to talk a little bit about histamine intolerance, which is a step down from an allergic reaction where you get really bizarre symptoms, particularly with food. And we're going to, we're going to talk about that in, in just a moment. So I want to give you just a little bit of geeky, a little bit of geek on, uh, on histamines. They are usually involved in local immune responses. So they are primary, um, they have a regulating uh, physiological function in the gut. And they also really interestingly act as a neurotransmitter in the, in the central nervous system. So the brain, uh, the spinal cord, as well as the uterus. And we will double click on that in just a moment. So, um, as I mentioned before, histamine is, um, a plays a central role as a mediator of itching. Um, and it is, uh, basically the one of the first responses to foreign, um, pathogens, and it is produced by two, um, two main cells. So it's produced by mast cells that are found in connective tissue. And they are also um, produced by basophils as well. And basically histamines are going to increase the permeability of the capillaries or capillaries uh, to white blood cells, right? So these are our um, macrophages. These are our defense, um, you know, our, um, our T cell mediated immune system. And it's going to allow those white blood cells to engage with the pathogen, uh, the illness to help get rid of it. Interestingly, what I, what, well, maybe interestingly, just to me, hopefully to you as well, um, mast cells, which are the cells that contain, uh, are the primary, um, cell that contains histamines. They are very numerous all around potential sites of injury. So we see lots of mast cells in the nose, the mouth, the feet, uh, blood vessels, internal body surfaces. Um, and so I find that really interesting that there's already this built in, you know, there's a concentration of these mast cells in the area that uh, we, the areas that are, there's a higher likelihood of injury there. And so they're released by mast cells, uh, by bat, or, and they are also released by basophils as well. But they are degraded by two main enzymes. One is called diamine ox, uh, oxidase, or DAO for short, uh, which is located primarily in the gut. And then another one, histamine N methyltransferase, or HMNT. So this is how histamine, so we have it released from the basophils, uh, the basophils from the mast cells, and then it's 
we don't want, we don't want histamines just like hanging out forever. So we have, uh, of course, built-in mechanisms via DAO in the gut and HNMT, uh, in the central nervous system to get rid of the histamine. So it doesn't continue to exert its effects. Now, here's where it gets really interesting. Of course, if you have genetic mutations, uh, what we call single nucleotide polymorphisms, or some of the cool cats will call these SNPs. But if we have these um, SNPs in our genes, um, these actually can be associated with a wide range of disorders, but primarily due to the inability of your body to degrade the histamine. And that's lead that leads to uh, an overactive immune system. And that can be anything from like ulcerative colitis uh, to painful periods to, uh, and we'll get into, we'll get into all the symptoms in just a moment, but degradation in these, um, if you, if you have impaired degradation of histamines, you are going to run into a whole host of problems. So let's talk a little bit about what those symptoms might be. So first thing, uh, is, um, we've, we've already uh, covered it mainly. We have the skin rashes, the hives, the eczema, the itching. So that's like anything on the surface of the skin, uh, where your histamines are trying to get rid of, uh, get rid of what it deems a foreign, um, or an invading pathogen or other, um, headache, um, migraines, dizziness, flushing in the face. And we're going to talk about foods, uh, in a moment. Um, and as you might suspect, if I'm talking about flushing in the face, we will be discussing alcohol momentarily, um, narrowed or runny nose. So, um, one of the cues is often when you start eating, if your nose starts running and it's like, why is this happening? <laughs> why is my nose running when I sit down to eat? Uh, this may be, uh, your body's, uh, this might be an, a histamine reaction. Uh, of course, it can move along the spectrum from a runny nose all the way to like difficulty breathing and bronchial asthma, sore throat, all that kind of stuff. In terms of GI distress, um, histamine, as we mentioned, um, the DAO enzyme uh, degrades histamine in the gut. And if we have too much histamine, if you have a, a genetic SNP there, things like bloating, uh, diarrhea, constipation, not in the extreme nausea or vomiting, uh, abdominal pain after eating, uh, heartburn is another one. Um, and things like high blood pressure, uh, or low blood pressure. I mean, this is like one of those, like, it's like everything it's like, but wait, there's more, you know, it's like high blood pressure and low blood pressure and tachycardia and cardiac arrhythmias, you know, all of these things, um, can be under the, and I don't mean to make light of these, but it, it's like all of these things can be under the influence of too much histamine release and, or poor histamine degradation. And then menstrual disorders. So I mentioned uh, the uterus before. So dysmenorrhea, cystitis, um, you know, mucosal irritation of uh, our anatomy of the, of the clitoris, the vulva, the vagina. Uh, in women. Uh, I mean, the list is really long here. Uh, uh, just to sort of cap it off, water retention, uh, you know, uh, joint pain, of course, that's related to the, um, uh, the mast cells being um, uh, concentrated in connective tissue, fatigue, seasickness, tiredness, sleep disorders, um, eating and having a ha fast heart rate for no reason, which we mentioned, uh, sitting to standing and getting dizzy from that is really, uh, a really big, um, problem, uh, anxiety out of the blue. Um, and then it's just basically random symptoms, uh, that you are unable to point to where it's coming from. And then we, you know, from a neurological perspective, it will also alter your sleep wake cycle. So some of the histamine neurons, um, come from, um, uh, an area in the hypothalamus that is involved in regulating the sleep wake the sleep wake cycle. And usually when these neurons are activated, it will promote like arousal. So you will be awake, uh, when you should be, um, asleep. And, um, 
so that's sort of a neural, uh, a neural back, uh, backdrop in terms of what may be happening in the brain that your sleep wake cycle, um, is altered. And normally these neurons should, these, uh, histamine neurons should be firing rapidly during, you know, during the day. Um, they should be firing more slowly during periods of relaxation or when you're tired and they should actually stop firing entirely, uh, during certain sleep stages like REM, um, uh, like REM sleep and even um, parts of non-REM sleep as well. So that's kind of the geeky science around histamine. And if you've been listening to this and you're like, oh, damn, yeah, I, I totally have like dermatitis. I have hives, I have flushing, or I have anxiety out of the blue. I have random symptoms every time I eat, my nose is running and I can't seem to pinpoint what's going on. I've been to my doctor. They have no idea. <laughs> they think I'm a basket case. Um, I'm going to I mean, here's the, here's the cruel part. Uh, I'm going to tell you about foods that are high in histamine and they're usually my, they are my favorite foods. I will preface it with that, will preface it with that. But we're going to talk about what you can do as well. If you're suspecting that you have uh, an overactive immune system and potentially histamine intolerance. And of course, while we're talking about histamine, I, I want to be clear that we're not talking about a full-fledged allergic reaction that histamines are also involved in. Um, what we're talking about today, the focus here is about histamine intolerance, where it is not uh, it is, it would be more a subclinical, um, presentation of an allergic reaction. It's not an allergic reaction yet. Um, so it would be what we would classify as subclinical. It wouldn't meet the qualifications for an allergic reaction, but it has, uh, you know, everything exists on a spectrum and this sort of, uh, we have a lot of the symptoms, albeit milder, that would coincide with an allergic reaction, like a skin hive, rash, ex eczema, itching, um, you know, the runny nose uh, certainly is not diagnostic of anything, but difficulty breathing, you know, bronchial asthma, having a sore throat, these things are starting to get a little bit more severe as we sort of move up that scale. So let's talk about foods that may be triggering this. And of course, when we think about histamine intolerance, it's all, it's always really important to consider the gut because the primary enzyme that degrades histamine DAO resides in the gut. So what are some foods that are rich in histamine? Well, <laughs> my favorites, meat and fish. So things like, um, and, and particularly smoked uh, meats, things like salami and um, cured meats, aged meats, the longer that the food has kind of been around, usually the more, the higher the histamine content, uh, canned fish, you know, things like tuna and ham, um, alcohol is another big category. So I mentioned before I sort of asterisk it, I gave you a little sneak peek with the flushing, um, of the, of the cheeks. This may also be, I mean, there's, you can talk about the tannins in wine and, and having an intolerance to tannins, um, but often um, things like beer, especially uh, fermented uh, beer, cloudy or colored beer, um, a lot of red wine, uh, very much a higher histamine uh, content. And then the heartbreaking part, I'm so sorry, but avocados, <laughs> the official mascot of the ketogenic diet is a very high fruit, uh, in, um, in histamines. So avocados, uh, citrus fruits. So anything that's yellow or orange. So things like, um, oranges and, uh, bananas and pineapples and papayas, um, strawberries I'd include in that as well are higher histamine foods, uh, vegetables. You're looking at things like eggplants and, um, tomatoes. And I'm, like I'm describing the Mediterranean diet. I'm actually describing the Estima diet right now. Um, beans also very high sauerkraut, spinach, um, things like that. So um, these are some foods that if you have poor gut health, if you have genetic polymorphisms in this DAO enzyme, um, you know, if you have gut dysbiosis, you are going to run into an issue here. So this is, um, it, it hasn't happened often in, in my experience, but there have been a few cases of women that are like, man, I am just not feeling really good on this, on this diet. Like I'm not feeling really good on this keto diet. And I'm wondering, you know, is it something that I'm doing wrong? And, you know, we sort of, uh, 
I'm going to talk to you a little bit about an elimination diet that I often recommend uh, as sort of a test to see whether or not um, whether or not the uh, the person might be histamine intolerant. So back to alcohol for a minute. Uh, alcohol is uh, what's called a histamine liberator. Uh, so it increases the permeability of the cell membrane and lowers that histamine tolerance uh, limit, which is usually why you get particularly strong reactions when you are mixing alcohol with histamine rich food. So for example, if you're having red wine and cheese, like how common is that pairing, right? You know, if you have those two foods together, or there's like a beautiful charcuterie board and you have the salamis and you have the figs, and then you have some strawberries and you have some avocado, like all of these things together and a little red wine, um, this can certainly in some people just cause them to feel absolutely absolutely crummy. And then last but not least, I also just want to mention that are, there are many medications that can also uh, really impact uh, histamines. So things like non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, like ibuprofen and aspirin, uh, antidepressants like the Cymbalta, the Effexor, the Prozac, the Zoloft, these can all, uh, these are all histamine liberators, um, immune modulators, right? Anything um, that... Um, is taken to mo to modulate uh, to downregulate the immune system, antihistamines so Benadryl and Allegra and all these all these different antihistamines also, uh, and then histamine blockers uh, will also alter the amount of histamine that you have, uh, and of course the um, the activity and the stress that you're putting on that DAO uh, enzyme. So, what can we do? The first thing, of course, is we can work on your gut health. So a lot of times people with histamine intolerance, so we are feeling really crummy after we're eating some of the foods that I just mentioned. Um, we can work on improving uh, if there is hyperpermeability of the gut, we can work to improve that. We can work to improve the diversity of species um, in the gut microbiome. So you can really look at whether or not you have uh, hyperpermeability of the gut by mapping out the GI. So there's a test uh, called the GI map. There are many others, but that's just the one that I really like. Uh, you need to have, you need to be, um, uh, that needs to be ordered through a functional medicine practitioner, but uh, you can do GI assays to take a look at the hyperpermeability um, of the gut, the species in the gut and how, uh, and how you're doing there. Uh, once you've mapped out the gut and hopefully you're working with a natural healthcare provider, like a chiropractor, like a naturopath, like some, a functional medicine provider could be a medical doctor or whoever, who's had extra training in how they can help to improve the gut microbiome. Um, you can do an elimination diet. So we, I was mentioning this a little earlier, if you I've listed out, you know, these high histamine foods. Um, if you eliminate them completely for two weeks and keep a symptom journal, um, what we want to be looking for is for some of those symptoms that I mentioned before to improve with your meals. Now, that being said, you know, I've basically just you know listed off high histamine foods, some of the best foods in my opinion on the planet, but so it's, it's hard to follow that kind of elimination diet long-term, a better strategy as a test is to have that elimination diet to allow for the uh, histamine degradation to occur. And for those symptoms to see that symptomatic improvement after eating. So not getting the runny nose when you're eating, not getting that GI distress, the bloating, the alternating constipation and diarrhea, all the things that, um, all the things that we uh, were talking about before. And then what you can do is after two weeks, you can slowly add them back in to see if your um, symptoms return. And if they do, we want to be adding in foods one at a time and then very slowly at that. So there's no cookie cutter, like add it in for three days and then try the next food. Um, but I would say at, at a minimum, um, you know, eat only that with the elimination diet, add in one of the foods that we mentioned before at a minimum, only add that one thing in for three to five days to see if your symptoms um, stay the same, 
you know, there's no change or they worsen. So if they worsen, you may just be particularly intolerant to that food because we often see with histamine intolerance, we often see a lot of food intolerance as well, but it heals with time as we get the gut back in, um, in order. So we have mapping out the GI, we have an elimination diet, and then a couple of things that you might consider in terms of supplementation. Uh, one of my favorites is supplementing with quercetin. This is a, uh, a bioflavonoid. It's found in fruit and vegetables, particularly in apples and onions. But of course, you're not going to eat like pounds and pounds of apples and pounds and pounds of onions, uh, unless if you, you know, maybe you want to keep some of your friends and maybe your partner. <laughs> uh, quercetin is, re- you know, it's, it's generally recognized as uh, what's called GRAS, generally recognized as safe. No real side effects have been noted um, in the doses that I'm going to, that I'm going to tell you about. So doses of quercetin uh, usually in the range of 13 to 25 milligrams uh, per kilogram of body weight, which translates to approximately 1100 to, uh, 2300 milligrams daily consumption of quercetin by itself in isolation. Uh, you can of course consume quercetin with other bio- bioflavonoids like resveratrol and, uh, EGCGs that's found in green tea. Those actually synergistically will increase the potency of quercetin. Uh, so that might be something that you consider supplementing with daily. Uh, that's one of my favorites actually is, is quercetin. Other things that you might consider is supplementing with vitamin C. So of course, vitamin C is really like famous, uh, for its ability to sequester free radicals in the body. Um, it helps, you know, it's replenished by antioxidant enzymes and, um, it, it allows, uh, there's actually some interesting research with vitamin C that allow, like the structure of vitamin C allows it to act uh, in, in the realm of depression, uh, as, as well as helping to modulate cortisol, which is super, um, exciting. So here, uh, when we're talking about dampening the immune system, uh, higher doses of vitamin C, 2000 milligrams daily, very well tolerated, um, and very, very much used to, uh, support, you know, support the immune system. Uh, it also has been shown to reduce the duration of the common cold. If that, you know, makes you, if that, you know, moves the needle for you in any way, uh, doesn't necessarily, uh, it, it may, I think that the research is still like unclear as to whether it reduces the duration or it reduces the symptoms. Uh, but the common cold, uh, which is a coronavirus, uh, supplementing with vitamin C does help to reduce the duration of that. And then the last one in my stack, if you will, is zinc. Uh, Love zinc. It has many, 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 many functions um, in the body. Um, I would say that as a daily prophylactic, uh, five to 10 milligrams daily, uh, and that would be for the entire population, for someone who is trying to heal from uh, histamine tolerance, a higher dose would be something like 25 to 45 um, milligrams with the upper tolerable limit before we start to see, you know, maybe GI up upset or distress around 40 uh, milligrams, but you have to sort of play with that uh, and figure out what is best for you. And of course I give you all these numbers and I give you these recommendations with the caveat that I am a doctor, but I am not your doctor. Uh, You need to be discussing this with your primary healthcare provider in order to make the best decision for you. So that's my, uh, that's my little, uh, that's my little shtick on uh, histamine. So if you are someone who has tried the ketogenic diet, um, in the past, and you just felt like you were having these like mild allergic reactions, if you will, hives and rashes and runny noses and GI distress, maybe what we want to do even before you do the ketogenic diet, because it is possible to to begin eating things like avocados again, to eat eggplants and to eat tomatoes again. But what we do have to do is we have to focus first on the gut. We have to be working with the gut integrity. So improving that hyperpermeability in the gut, first and foremost, um, improving the diversity of species uh, in the gut. And then from there, I would move on, as I mentioned, to that elimination diet where we just 
put you on an unfortunately super restrictive diet for two weeks, but we can do anything difficult for two weeks. Right. Um, and then slowly, but surely add in one of that long list, you know, three to five days to make sure that your symptoms don't worsen. So it's kind of a long, uh, you know, that elimination diet and reintegration, uh, is, is really important. And whenever, you know, the other thing that I'll add here is whenever we talk about elimination diets, some patients, um, you know, because they feel so much better after they have uh, eliminated that food, they are so scared to add it back in. And I think that, you know, if you're a, if you're a clinician that's listening to this, we want to really be counseling our patients that this is a temporary intervention. You know, in the same way that I might recommend to someone who only eats fish, that maybe they want to eat red meat for a therapeutic intervention um, for a short period of time, if we're trying to improve, you know, I don't know, B, their B12 status or their iron, you know, maybe they want to consider having organ meats or something like that. If the same is true for our histamine intolerant patients or anybody really that's undergoing a elimination diet, because the point of an elimination diet is not to keep you there forever, right? The point is to have this therapeutic, this nutritive intervention almost like, you know, it's a therapy. And then as that therapeutic uh, works, as we move the patient closer and closer to baseline, closer and closer to homeostasis, then we want to increase their resilience. We want to increase their capacity, right? Because the elimination diet is almost like shrinking, right? It's like, okay, we got to like addition through subtraction. We got to get rid of all this stuff, heal the gut. But then we also want the gut to be responsive. We want there to be, as I was saying, diversity of species. You want to be able to eat uh, as many things as your heart and your belly desire. And so staying in that elimination phase, this is where I think a lot of people, clinicians included, get it wrong, where they feel better symptomatically on the elimination diet and they never actually come back to reintroducing the food. That's a really, really important part of uh, your healing journey. So that's my little geek, a little bit more geek than magic uh, this week, but I wanted to talk about histamines because this is something that comes up um, enough in um, uh, in the uh, keto community that I think it warrants uh, a bit of a geeky magic dive. So I hope that you found this useful and I hope that you are going to take some of this information in stride, maybe take it to your, uh, take it to your primary healthcare provider and I'm excited to see what comes of it. 